Hello and welcome to ED Insight, where we get you a 360 degree view of the big picture in business and economy. I'm Sridhar Ramakrishnan. On the show today, how microfinance, the bastion of the non-profit movement, is slowly turning capitalistic. Why microfinance is in severe need of a regulatory framework. And the big debate, should microfinance be a profit-making industry or a non-profit movement? Our top story first. For a decade now, microfinance institutions have played a key role in putting money in the hands of some of the poorest Indians. But in a country where nearly 700 million people live on less than a dollar a day, their work has just begun. They need to raise thousands of crore rupees more and possibly get commercially minded. Nikhil Shivadas takes you inside an industry that's at the crossroads. Ladies and gentlemen, in about 30 seconds, SK's Microfinance Limited is due to be listed. On Call it what you will. Ringing in a new era or simply announcing to the world that times have changed. The successful listing of India's largest microfinance institution, SKS, is the clearest indicator yet that microfinance in India need no longer remain purely a social venture. The mission of our company is to provide financial services to the poor. We believe that using a commercial model, tapping commercial markets, is the best way to get capital in order to achieve financial inclusion. SKS raised $358 million in its IPO, which was oversubscribed 13 times. Today, the company boasts of a market cap of over $2 billion. The success of SKS has paved the way for other MFIs that are seeking additional capital. Those in queue include Share Microfinance, Bandhan and Spandana's Sporty Financial Services. IPO is uh, one of the options uh, to access capital markets and uh, it will increase uh, transparency, it will increase corporate governance and uh, it is a good thing to think of uh, making uh, the public uh, as partners. It could be number, they also providing some capital to the sector. But this amount is very poor amount according to the, you compare to the population and demand of the microfinance services for the country. In that context, who will we provide it? We must be go to the private equity investor or other outside investor on that. IPOs are also needed because PE investors who have so far funded these institutions are now looking for a profitable exit. It's important to note that many of these investors valued Indian MFIs in price per book value terms significantly higher than MFIs of any other country. That's partly because India is the single biggest microfinance opportunity in the world. An opportunity that 4,000 MFIs, self-help groups and regional rural banks are seeking to tap in a big way. But as in all businesses, here too only the fittest will survive. If you can become a commercial entity and you can make profit to attract capital, then you will be able to achieve the goal of financial inclusion. That's perhaps why the top five microfinance companies in India are for-profit organizations that have jointly dispersed loans worth 67.9 billion rupees to an estimated 10 million customers. That's nearly 50% of all MFI disbursements in India. Here's how the business works. The MFI either borrows money from a bank at 11% or raises the capital from other sources for much higher than that. Add to that administration charges like salaries and conveyance of about 11.8%. Assuming that the margins are around 3 to 4%, the MFI gets about 26 rupees for every 100 rupees lent. To be fair, there are many MFIs who make much lower margins, but they find it tough to survive. Once you need to pay for your staff and meet the financial cost, definitely you need to go for a for-profit organization. A 2009 survey of 230 MFIs revealed that one in every three players was loss-making. MFIs have to necessarily reduce their cost of capital to be profitable. And to do that, they need to charge higher interest rates. But that's seen as profiting from the poor. Where it turns problematic is if institutions that are serving the poor are profit-maximizing. That means if they're, if they're making policies in order to maximize their own profits, and perhaps exploiting you know, the need of the poor, the credit constraints of the poor. Critics have accused for-profit MFIs of not providing clear and accurate loan terms to borrowers. 
is regarding due diligence in providing credit, practicing coercive recovery methods, and offering multiple loans to borrowers who they know cannot meet repayment schedules. All aspects of predatory lending. There are only two large MFIs that have reduced their interest rates as a result of scale. Uh, Bandan in, uh, <coughs> in West Bengal and uh, Ujivan, which is a urban uh, program. But the big ones, uh, SKS, uh, Share, Spandana, Equitas, they have not reduced their interest rates. So we can, even though they're making very large profits. This first came to light in 2006 when villagers from Krishna district in Andhra Pradesh filed a complaint against two MFIs accusing them of exorbitant interest rates and forced loan recovery practices. Soon the two MFIs had to shut 50 branches in the district. A similar matter came up last year in Kola district in Karnataka when a borrower committed suicide as he was unable to pay 7.5 lakh rupees he had borrowed from MFIs. And in February this year too, a similar suicide case came up in Kamam district in Andhra Pradesh. This in turn prompted the then collector to file a complaint against MFIs acting as money lenders in the district. The interest they were charging was exorbitantly high. It, is, it was as high as 60%, 75% like that. And uh, they do aggressive lending. They go door to door and uh, they uh, keep on tempting the people. You take a loan, we are giving... Uh, very easy, you take the loan and installment repayment is very easy. And uh, the things are not transparent. The quest for profits many say could increase such problems. Despite these criticisms, there is no doubt that microfinance has changed the rural landscape in a big way. These institutions have reached where banks could not. And now over 67 million people have easy access to capital. Capital that carries a cost. Because the funds that these institutions lend don't come for free. It will really be some magician from outer space who will really be able to, you know, uh, produce and deliver this service at the doorstep uh, at a rate substantially lower than what we do. Which means that non-profit turning for profit may not be such a bad thing after all. This model has worked. It has proved itself and has proved itself on a, on a sustainable basis and that on a non-subsidy based basis. It's important to keep MFIs working because they are reaching out to the unbanked segments of society and providing capital to those who really need it. But it's an industry that's growing at a scorching pace and dealing with sensitive issues. And so it's better to regulate it. So what you have is a sector growing rapidly without any checks and balances. So is it the right time to regulate MFIs? That story is coming up after the short break. Stay with us.